Oh Lord God, it is only because of your grace, only because of your work, your conquering of sin and death that we could sing such things. Haste today in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Our hearts have broken this week. Our hearts have ached with the news of the tragedy in the Kelso family. So many thoughts reverberate through the recesses of our minds. And what we need this morning, what we need together as a family, is to hear from God. We're going to be in Romans 5. You can turn there in your Bibles. I want to begin by reading Psalm 46. And a songwriter, one of the sons of Korah, put these words to music. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth should change and the mountains slip into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains quake at its swelling pride. Selah. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy dwelling places of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She will not be moved. God will help her when morning dawns. The nations made an uproar. The kingdoms tottered. He raised his voice. The earth melted. Yahweh of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our stronghold. Selah. Come, behold the works of Yahweh, who has wrought desolations in the earth. He makes wars to cease to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow and cuts the spear in two. He burns the chariots with fire. Cease and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. Yahweh of armies is with us. The God of Jacob is our stronghold. Selah. Josh and Julie and Asher and Elijah and Kyla have found refuge and strength in a present time in trouble. They have found these things in God, in his character, in his goodness, in his sovereignty, in his love, and they have drawn from the deep well of God's word for a long time. This is reflected in some of the things that they have said this week in the midst of traumatic shock and profound sorrow, these words have been on Josh and Julie's lips. Quote, the deepest sorrow under God's grace is sweeter than the greatest joys under his wrath. Great is his faithfulness. Josh said, I'm so thankful that God's word is in my mind broadly. When I didn't have to open a Bible and I could hear God's voice in his word from things that he had tucked away. Josh said, I think I know experientially James 1 when James writes, let endurance have its perfect work. Endurance under a difficult and unchanging circumstance designed by God to accomplish something. What is it that James 1 says? To accomplish our completion, our perfection, our maturity in Christ. Christ Christ-likeness. And endurance under trial does that. Josh said, Isaiah 66 is the man to whom God will look, humble and contrite of heart trembling at his word. Josh is thankful for trial that softens the heart and tenderizes the soul under the word of God. Josh said, blessed be the name of the Lord. He gives and he takes away. We will not bless him when he gives and curse him when he takes away. We will say, blessed be the name of the Lord at all times. Josh said, if but one person's faith is strengthened, we would see God's goodness in this trial. 
And if God would be pleased to bring one person to himself as a result, our joy would be unspeakable. Who thinks like this? Truly, Josh, you have been my pastor this week. You remember Josh's expositions of James and Colossians? James, a wisdom from God, while under trial, under God's design, to bring us to Christ's likeness. In Colossians, the sufficiency of Christ, the sufficiency of his word, to supply every need that the Christian has. And what Josh preached, what he taught us, he lives. Josh and Julie have always been sympathetic friends, wise counselors, gentle encouragers, and they continue to be these things in their darkest days. This is otherworldly stuff. They have resources in Christ, fuel, and treasure in his word that the world knows nothing of. In Ecclesiastes 7, Solomon and his wisdom from God reminds us, it is better to go to a house of mourning than to a house of feasting. Why? Because that is the end of every man and the living takes it to heart. Sorrow is better than laughter. A face can be sad and the heart may be happy and the mind of the wise is in the house of the morning. The mind of fools is in the house of pleasure. It's good for us to be here, to weep, to mourn, to grieve, to come to grips with the gravity of death and sin, the shortness of life. Solomon goes on in Ecclesiastes 8. No man has authority to restrain the wind with the wind, and no man has authority over the day of death. In Ecclesiastes 12.5, Solomon writes, man goes to his eternal home while mourners go about in the street. And there's a reality that while we all here grieve, while we here feel this profound sadness and come to grips with the reality that is true for everyone who walks God's earth. There is a world outside that goes about its business and forgets and ignores and suppresses. And we need to be here. And we enter into the Kelso's suffering not completely, how could we? Perhaps like a rock skipping over the surface of a lake, we enter their suffering. And the Kelso family will feel this deeply for a long time to come. All of us are heartbroken with them and for them. We need in these moments the truth of God's word. We need to be arrested and we need to be comforted by the truth that God, the universe's sovereign orchestrator, and our tender shepherd, those truths that God discloses to us in his word. We remember fundamentally that we are but creatures. We are created beings. He is the creator. We are dependent creatures. We don't self-exist. We exist by his word, by his doing. And we are mortal creatures, subject to death, and we are sinful creatures deserving of death. What do we deserve as creatures dependent, mortal, and sinful? The humans, by the way, have always been and always will be dependent, and we have always been and will always be creatures. Humanity has not always been subject to death, and humanity has not always been sinful. And there is a day coming when what was the original order of things will be the final order of things. Whence comes death? Where did death come from? How, how did it get here? 
So we need to look this morning at Romans chapter 5. And we're looking this morning at the intrusion of death and the demolition of death. We need to see both of these this morning. It was in November of 2017 that Scott Maxwell walked us through this verse. It took him months and months and months. No, he was six sermons through Romans 5. And he carefully, in a very detailed way, walked us through the intrusion of death into humanity and our solidarity with Adam, but believers' solidarity with Christ and the comparison and the contrast that is so essential for us to understand. We're going to skim over this chapter. I want to connect two verses for you, and really we want to trace the intrusion of death through to the demolition of death by looking at Romans 5.12 and Romans 5.18. Look down with me and let's read together Romans 5.12. Therefore, just as through one man sin entered into the world and death through sin, and so death spread to all men on account of which all sinned, dash. Do you see the dash there at the end of verse 12? Paul has started a thought that he doesn't complete until verse 18. Drop down to verse 18. Paul picks up this same thought and then completes it. He says, so then, as through one transgression there resulted condemnation to all men, even so, through one act of righteousness, there resulted justification of life to all men. And what Romans 5.12 and what Romans 5.18 do for us this morning is help us understand death as an intruder and death's obliteration. Death's intrusion through one act and through one man, Adam, and death's obliteration through one act and through one man, the Lord Jesus Christ. And all those who are attached to Adam, subject to death and condemnation, but all those who are attached to Christ, justification unto life. That's what we want to look at this morning. The intrusion and demolition of death, each brought about by one act and one man, Adam and Christ, and the comparison made between what Adam did that introduced death to the world and what Christ did to demolish death for all who belong to him. And what you find between verses 12 and 18 is a digression. It's not unimportant, but it's a digression that gives some explanation to particularly a Jew and Gentile audience who would need to understand the relationship of the introduction of death to Mosaic law and the introduction of death to Messiah's coming. This digression has really two parts to it. In verses 13 and 14, the digression explains the entrance of sin and death as it relates to God's giving of the law through Moses. And notice what Paul says. For until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam until Moses, even those, even over those who had not sinned in the likeness of the offense of Adam, who is a type of him who was to come. See Maxwell for the full explanation. I'll give you a summary. Death before Mosaic law, death before Mosaic law, proves that men are spiritually dead and they are sinners by nature who sinned by activity even without being given an explicit command. Adam was given an explicit command. He transgressed it. Those under Mosaic law were given explicit commands. They transgressed. And the sin is worse when an explicit command is transgressed. Nevertheless, people died outside of the explicit command proving they were sinners by nature and by activity. This universal infection is demonstrated by death's universal grip. And the second digression, verses 15 to 17, seeks to explain the ways that the comparison between Adam and Christ break down. Not all analogies are 
perfect. This analogy has some ways that Adam and Christ are alike, but a lot of ways in which they're different. And so as not to be misunderstood, Paul wants to get down to how they are different so that when he makes the comparison, we don't go too far. Verses 15 to 17 read this. The free gift is not like the transgression. For if by the transgression of the one the many died, much more did the grace of God and the gift by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, abound to the many. And the gift is not like that which came through the one who sinned. For on the one hand, the judgment arose from one transgression, resulting in condemnation. But on the other hand, the free gift arose from many transgressions, resulting in justification. For if by the transgression of the one, death reigned through the one, much more those who receive the abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness will reign through the one, Jesus Christ, and they will reign in life. Again, see Maxwell for the fuller explanation I will sum up. This digression in verses 15 to 17 explains the ways that what Adam did and what Christ did are not the same. What Adam did to introduce death is unlike what Christ did to demolish death. And the first in verse 15 is a difference in value. A difference in value. What Adam did brought about for all of humanity a deserved, abject destitution the ultimate impoverishment. And what Christ did, according to verse 15, is bring about undeserved and abounding gifts. In fact, Paul uses emphatic language to say, here's what Adam did, but how much more so what Christ did. The second difference is in verse 16. It's a difference in standing. What Adam did brought about condemnation. What Jesus Christ did brings about justification. And again, emphatic language, how much greater what Christ did. And the third difference is a difference in mortality, we might say, or a difference in our relationship to death. That for those in Adam, death reigns. Death literally kings. Death rules. But for those in Christ, who reigns? Verse 17. People. The people who belong to Christ king, they rule, they reign in the sphere of life. If we summarize all differences, in Adam, bad. In Christ, much more really gooder. (laughs) That's the difference. And what we need to see this morning is the connection between verses 12 and 18. So we're going to fly over those digressions. <laughs> Do you see the dash again at the end of verse 12? That's a thought waiting to be finished. Paul begins verse 12 by saying, just as, and that just as is a word that anticipates an even so. And there's no even so in verse 13. You get the digressions we just summarized. The even so does not come until verse 18. Do you see it there in the middle of the verse? And verse 18 begins with a re-summary of what was said in verse 12 so that we get the completed sentence. The first half of verse 18 restates verse 12. But this time, the second half of verse 18, Paul finishes the thought. And this is the thought we need to get to this morning. The complete thought is this. Death intrudes for all in Adam. And the second half of the thought is, death is demolished for all in Christ. That's the idea of this section. And we need to be reminded this morning about where death came from. Look back at verse 12. Therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world, death through sin, death spread to all men, on account of which all sinned. Sin entered Sin breached the wall and came in. And through that hole that sin entered the world, death came with it. And death spread. And because death spread, everyone sinned. And this cycle continues. 
everyone subject to death. And if we combine the ideas of verse 12 and the first half of verse 18, we also pick up the concept of condemnation. Do you see that in verse 18? As through one transgression there resulted condemnation to all men. That is the just deserts for sin. Now in verse 12, the last three words are an unhelpful translation. Uh, The Bible I'm reading from reads, because all sinned. Death spread to everybody because everybody sinned. It makes it sound like death is universal because all of us sinned before death came in. As if perhaps all of us were in the garden with Adam in some mysterious way. Or or perhaps we are all guilty by imputation of Adam's sin who was our representative in the garden. That is a popular theological view. But if you remember from our study of Romans 5 when Scott preached through this, verse 12 should read, Through one man sin entered the world, death entered through sin, and so death spread to all men. And because of all of that, and particularly because of the spiritual death that all humanity inherits and experiences, all sin. The argument Paul is making is not everybody is spiritually dead or in a spiritually dead condition and experience physical mortality because we are all in the garden sinning. Paul's argument is through Adam, sin and death entered the world. Spiritual death was the consequence for all of humanity. And that spiritual death is the nature that we have that produces sinful activities. We sin because we are sinners by nature. And that nature came from this spiritual death that spread to all men when Adam sinned and that death entered the world. That is Paul's argument that sets up the comparison and the contrast to the work of Christ in this chapter. Sin is universal because the human race is spiritually dead. And we sin precisely because we no longer naturally possess spiritual life. Death came in, death brought sin, sin brought condemnation. This results in death, physical death, eternal death, hopelessness. And in all of this, we recognize from verse 12 that death is an intruder. Death broke into what God had said was very good. And remember, God made man and woman. God made humanity. And God gave humanity responsibility and a possession and a realm. And said all of it is very good. And then death entered. Death is wrong. Death is an enemy. Death breaks apart the human constitution. Death breaks the material and immaterial parts of man and disintegrates what man was made to be by God. Death separates body from spirit. Death separates friends and death separates loved ones. Death separates man from the world he was supposed to dwell on, to rule over, to work in, to play in, to enjoy all to the glory of God. And worst of all, death separates man from God. The spiritual death resulting in a sin nature has been the condition of natural man ever since the fall. But it was not originally natural to man. But now, Ephesians 2 is true. Dead in transgressions and sins, we walk. We sin by behavior Thoughts, motives, intentions, activities, all of them corrupt, polluted, antithetical, and antagonistic to God because we are sinful by nature. And that sin nature is the evidence of our spiritual death. The humans have been, ever since the fall in Genesis 3, truly the walking dead. And the spiritually dead are unable to remedy their own condition. And when Paul says sin entered the world in verse 12, we we don't think of sin as some substance, some thing, an entity with some molecular structure or some spirit with personal properties. 
Sin or evil is simply that which lacks conformity to the command of God or the character of God or the goodness of God. And when creatures sin, they manifest their failure to conform to God's character and will. And we live in a, we live in a world characterized by sin and death. And part of the deception of sin and part of the blindness of our sin nature is we suppress those truths. We, we want to salve our consciences with false comforts. Oh, we're not really that bad. I'm not as bad as I could be. But we'll all get along. Life is good. No, my friends, life is under the curse of God from Genesis 3 because of the rebellion of man against his maker. And who can unbend what God has bent Ecclesiastes 7. Nobody can undo this. Nobody with the spiritual resources of spiritual death can provide the resources required for life. No human has these answers. This unnatural intruder has become the unavoidable reality of humanity. We all sin and we all will die. But let's finish Paul's sentence, begun in verse 12, completed in verse 18. Just as through one man sin entered the world and death through sin, death spread to all men, all sinned, condemnation follows. Verse 18, even so, through one act of righteousness, there resulted justification of life to all men. Notice what Paul does not say. By a bunch of acts of righteousness by those spiritually dead people, they pulled themselves up by their own moral bootstraps and fixed their own problems by religion and do-gooding and try-harding. No, by one act. This is the demolition of death. And it is all to be accounted to God's grace, God's mercy, God's power, God's resources, God's undeserved favor, mercy, grace, and love. And God's love on display in this passage is not wishful thinking, oh, those poor people, if only something could be done. No, this is active, real love that actually saves sinners from sin and death. Look what Paul says, even so, through one act of righteousness, justification of life. And he details here a means and a result. The means is that one act of righteousness, and what Paul means here by one act of righteousness is the cross. The cross. That Jesus came, the righteous one, the one who never sinned in obedience to his Father out of love for hopeless, helpless sinners. He submitted to his Father's will and he went to the cross. Think about what Jesus did there. Jesus the Christ endured and conquered death. And Jesus the Christ endured and conquered a death that no one else has ever, nor will anyone else ever endure and conquer. The death he endured and conquered at the cross was a death of infinite proportions. It is the death of the eternal wrath of God waged against sin that Jesus Christ himself bore at the cross. And listen, friends, those who died outside of Christ will endure that death, but will never conquer it. And all those who are in Christ have conquered that death already and will never endure it. Because Jesus himself endured and conquered that 
death. That death was the outpouring of the wrath of his father against the sins of everyone who would ever believe, past, present, and future. And Jesus Christ drank that wrath, that cup of wrath, down to its dregs so that there is none left for all who would be in him. This is why the comparison between what Christ did and what Adam did breaks down. What Jesus did is so very much better than what Adam did, so very much bigger than what Adam did. Jesus fully endured that death. He conquered that death, and he rose again. He walked out of his own tomb. He demonstrated to the world, to the universe, to the powers that be, that he had satisfied the justice of God in paying for our sins. The price demanded by God, not for his own sins, he had none, but for the sins of his people. God describes it this way, Yahweh was pleased to crush him, putting him to grief, so that he would justify the many bearing their iniquities. And if ever there was a father who knew experientially what it was to crush the son of his love, it is the one who purposed this death in Christ. The one who knew no sin became sin on our behalf. And God in his love loved us while we were at our worst, while we were his enemies. While we were spiritually dead, unable, unwilling, he looked on our helpless state with compassion and love and mercy and grace. The means of the abolishment of death is the cross of Christ. The result in the last part of verse 18, Paul calls justification of life. Justification of life. And the word justification here is a legal term. It is a forensic declaration of rightness of rightness. It is a declaration of a legal standing. It is the putting forth someone as vindicated. It is the putting forward one as if they have never done any wrong and have always done right. And listen, no sinner is justified in God's sight by anything the sinner offers. But a sinner can be justified in God's sight declared to be righteous before all of heaven, before every accuser, on the basis of faith in the work of Christ. That God is willing to declare you, believer in Christ, as if you had never done anything wrong and as if you had always done everything right, and he is willing to put the ungodly forward as godly, as righteous, vindicated before the universe, as bearing his perfect standard. Justification of life here indicates that this legal declaration results in life. That is, in the destruction of death, the demolition of death, the undoing of death. For everyone who is justified has been pronounced by God in heaven to be without sin. That is a new status. Every past present and future sin of everyone in this category is wiped clean and replaced by a credit of righteousness. And of course not our righteousness, but his righteousness, Christ's righteousness credited to our account. Listen, Christian, union with Christ, which is what this chapter is all about and the subsequent chapters in Romans, union with Christ one of the fruits of justification, 5.1 begins, having been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. The enmity is put away, the hostility is put away, adoption has begun, a new relationship to God personally through Jesus Christ. All of these fruits of justification mean that our union with Christ by faith puts us in a new relationship to death. 
Paul goes on in Romans 6 to tell us that we are united to Christ in his death and have been raised to new life in him. If you are a Christian here this morning, you have already died to your old self and now in Christ, united with his death, united with his resurrection, you walk in newness of life with the guarantee of eternal life that begins at new birth and continues on into eternity. A believer is now a possessor of eternal life. And because of this new status, the eternal consequence of sin, condemnation and eternal death is completely removed. Death has no hold on a believer. Death has no claim on a believer. Jesus himself said in John 11, if you believe in me, even if you die, you will live. And if you believe in me, you'll never die. The reality is that those who are joined to Christ have new life in them that transcends death. For those outside of Christ, however, death yet reigns. And death, this enemy, this intruder into the original order of things, is called an enemy. Paul in 1 Corinthians 15, 26 calls it the last enemy. That is when Jesus Christ puts all his enemies under his boot, death, that last enemy, will be there too. And Jesus will reign triumphant over death itself. Death will come to its own grisly end we see that in Revelation 20:14, when death itself, death personified, is thrown into the lake of fire. Revelation 21:4 says, "There will no longer be death in that new heavens and new earth, that place where those who belong to Christ will live forever and ever and ever with him." Adam or Christ? Friends, where are you? Are you in Adam? Do you still belong to Adam? Or do you belong to Christ? Under Adam, death reigns. In Christ, Christian, believer, you reign over death. You reign in life. Do you have faith? Not amorphous faith that just has confidence in airy nothingness. Not faith in faith. Not faith in just something, pick anything. But faith in Christ. Have you placed your trust in the finished work of Christ on the cross to take away your sin and to make you right before God and to bring you into new life? Have you done that? Faith is a trust that Jesus died in your place to take away your sins. It is also entrusting yourself to Jesus, personally trusting yourself to the conqueror of death. And friends, what could possibly be worth holding on to in this life that you would reject the rule of Christ? What would you give in exchange for your soul? What would you trade for Christ? What would you cling to that could possibly be worth it. Friend, leave it all behind and run to Christ and have him and know his love and know what it means to have life in him, to belong to him, to cry out, Daddy, to the judge of all the earth and the father of all things. I'm going to close in prayer and the band is going to come up and we're going to sing a closing song. And then we're going to officially dismiss. And if you need to leave, uh, this will be the official end of our time together. But uh, I'm going to invite you to stay and we're going to sing some more. Uh, we're going to pray some more and read some more scripture together as a family. Um, so as I close in prayer... The band will come, um, and then I'll, I'll come up and close again.
we'll go from there. Heavenly Father, you are the Father of all just by the fact that you created all, but you are our Father because you have graciously sought us, found us, rescued us, and adopted us. You have made us your own and you have been willing to be called by us. You've been willing to have your name attached to our names. And it is to you we sing, it is to you we pray, it is to you we cling. In Jesus' name.